You're listening to the Born to Kick Ass podcast with Matt Tomassi and can be found at borntokickass.com slash episode 13. Welcome to the Born to Kick Ass podcast, where you're introduced to the most fascinating people on the planet. Learn the ingredients of greatness that you can apply to your life. And now your host, Matthew Tomassi. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook of your choice and a 30-day free trial by visiting borntokickass.com slash audible. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle or MP3 player. To download your free audiobook today, go to borntokickass.com slash audible. Again, that's borntokickass.com slash audible for your free audiobook. Do you know someone or know of someone who walks the walk and would like to hear them on the Born to Kick Ass podcast? They can be from any field, but they need to have an inspiring story that will help to motivate others to achieve their own goals. If you do, please head over to borntokickass.com slash suggest a guest and fill out the form. We'd love to hear from you. Matt Fitzgerald is a marathon runner, Ironman triathlete, coach, certified sports nutritionist, and has authored over 20 best-selling books. Matt goes into detail about his newly published book, How Bad Do You Want It? Mastering the Psychology of Mind Over Muscle. The books mentioned in this episode are available in audio format and can be downloaded free along with a 30-day free trial by visiting borntokickass.com slash audible. Again, that's born to kickass.com slash audible. Enjoy the interview. G'day Matt Fitzgerald, it's Matt here and welcome to the Born to Kick Ass podcast. Great to be with you. Uh, cool name by the way. Yeah, yours isn't too bad either. <laughs> yeah. Um, congratulations on your new book. Um, how bad do you want it? You've recently, when did that come out? Was that end of last year? Yes, end of last year. Yeah, no, it's a great book. I've literally just finished the audio version of it uh, about an hour ago. It's a really good book. It really delves into the the psychology of um, um, winning and overcoming. Uh, but we we can definitely get into that. But before we do, could you maybe give us a a background on yourself, uh, where you grew up, um, how you got into running, and and I guess how you got into writing as well. Sure. Yes. Uh, so I grew up on the East Coast of the United States in a little state called New Hampshire, mainly. Our family bounced around a little bit before we settled there. Um, and I'm very much a chip off the old block in relation to my father, who uh, is a writer and uh, started running marathons in the early, mid-1980s. Um, and when I was still quite young, I decided that I liked running too and that I also wanted to be a writer. Um, I didn't necessarily intend to, to write about running and, and other endurance sports. It just kind of worked out that way. Um, so I'm actually, I feel I'm quite blessed because, you know, that, that is my career now. Um, it's just really melding two passions together. Um, so I, I pinch myself every morning when I wake up. And you got a, did you, your main sort of writing career, did that kick off uh, with Triathlete Magazine? Uh, yeah, I guess, um, um, my first break was with, um, a different magazine that was started by, uh, a gentleman named Bill Katowski, who was the original founder of triathlete magazine. Um, I was only 12 years old when triathlete was founded, but, uh, about a dozen years after that, uh, Bill started up a magazine called multi-sport in, uh, it's based close to San, uh, San Francisco. I had just moved out to the West Coast, and I was really looking for just any writing job I could get. I wasn't even running at the time. I was out of shape and overweight. Um, but I took that job, and it sort of relit the spark. Uh, you know, Suddenly, I was surrounded by athletes again, and I, I got the hunger to 
start training and, and competing again. And, and then that break career wise really just led to everything that followed. So I guess as part of that job, um, was the culture within that company, uh, I'm guessing it'd be a, a really healthy culture and maybe was it somewhat competitive as well? You know, like people going for the runs during the lunchtime and was there any of that at all? Yes. I mean, I can tell from the way you framed the question that you, you're imagining that the, the staff was larger than it was. In fact, it was just three of us. <laughs> yeah. The, the other two were, in fact, you know, athletes. And, you know, by the time it was all said and done, I was I was an athlete again myself. Uh, yeah. Yeah, cool. And with running, were you um, more sort of the the sprints or um, longer distances? What, what was your what sort of um, where did you sort of gravi- gravitate towards? Yeah, you know, once I got back in shape, um, it was it was I made a pretty quick transition into triathlons. Um, it, this would have been in 1998. I did my first triathlon, uh, but I I I. I you know, the dream to run a marathon was born around that same time as well. I think I ran my first marathon in 1999. As it turned out, you know, looking back, I was always better suited to shorter races. I think maybe a you know 10k half marathon was my sweet spot. But you know how it is. Um, you know, if you're a serious runner, you just kind of feel obligated to run marathons, and these days even ultra mar- marathons. So I I kept trying. I, I never really ran a marathon. I was truly fully satisfied with but uh you know it was the the challenge of trying to crack that nut you know kept me coming back and i understand recently you've um just completed the boston marathon yep um do you need to qualify to get into boston you do with some exceptions um uh the first time i ran it i did it the same way everyone else does i I qualified and, and ran um and then this time I was actually invited to participate as part of a group. It was a, co- a company uh, called Highlands uh, that's one of the Boston Marathon sponsors. And, and you know, they, as part, I guess, part of their sponsorship, they got a certain amount of slots that they could hand out. And they, they handed them out to kind of prominent American runners, um, well, you know, bloggers and writers like myself, and it actually invited us. I had no intention of running Boston this year, even though I actually had qualified um, I qualify for Boston every time I run, I run a marathon. So that's, that's not an issue, but I just hadn't, ha- I had intended to go back, but when they invited me, I, I thought, well, that's, that's a cool opportunity. I was planning to run my first ultra marathon, a 50 miler just 16 days before. So I asked them, well, is that okay? You know, I don't know <laughs> how my legs are going to be. And they said it was okay. So I did it. And how were the legs? You know, not bad. You know, at this point, you know, I'm, I'm, I actually had just turned 45 yesterday. So you know, my motivations to train and race are a little different than before. You know, when I was younger, I, I wanted everything to be perfect. And I wanted to, you know, every race to be the best race I could possibly run. I'm still competitive and I still have, you know, set goals, but I'm also equally motivated just to experiment and try things and experience things. Um, and so I approached this, you know, this winter and spring uh, kind of as, as a bit of an experiment. So I wanted to, you know, run my first ultra marathon and then see you know, what would happen, you know, if I ran a marathon 16 days later, um, you know, because I'm very experienced, I'm a coach. Uh, and, and so I, you know, I should be able to avoid making dumb mistakes, you know, in, in trying to, uh, you know, address a challenge like that. And what was the ultra that you ran? Was it 16 days beforehand before the um, Boston? What was that one? It's a very old one uh, here in California called the American River 50 Mile. Um, it's that, just a couple hours drive from where I live. And what's the terrain like on that that uh, that ultra? It's kind of a tale of two courses. So the first half is, you know, with, with some exceptions, is reasonably flat, and a lot of it is actually on uh, paved surfaces. And then the second half is very technical. Uh, very hilly. Um, and the last three miles, you're almost scaling a cliff face. It's it's pretty, yeah, it's diabolical. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, how did that ultra, um, with the technical part and, you know, the, the, the steep climbs and descents, how tough is that compared to a road marathon like the Boston? 
you know, but you know, with a with a road marathon, that's just that is in some ways just as brutal as some ultras because of the pounding on the road and just the the relentless pace that you got to keep up. How did they compare for you? Yeah, it is very different, and you know, I, I made a lot of uh, rookie mistakes, um, and one of them was just lack of course specific preparation. So I was very fit, um, but I was not. Uh, I just hadn't done a lot of running on that type of terrain, and I was, you know, when I was young, I did all the time. But I would just, you know, I, it's kind of a use it or lose it type of thing. I was poorly adapted to that, um, so you know, it, it was it was very challenging. Um, and you know, I didn't perform as well uh, as I hoped, uh, I would do. Um, and, but you know, that's, you know, you want to come away from every, every race with, um, some lessons learned and, and I, you know, it, it makes me want to apply them the next go around. Now with, uh, your writing, how many books have you written to date? Um, I honestly don't even know. <laughs> it's, uh, more than 25, less than 30, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I've got a couple of books of yours. I've got uh, Racing Weight, um, which is really good. I've also got the Fifty Fifty, the Dean Carnezes one, and um, yeah, as I mentioned before, the uh, the audio version of um, How Bad Do You Want It. I'm really keen to. Uh, there's a a bit that I want to touch on in in your in that new book, but uh, we'll get to that in a sec. Um, I am interested in getting. You've got an, the audio version of the Iron War as well. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of getting that one next. Yeah, that that in my opinion uh, is is my best book. So uh, I, I encourage you to to go ahead and do that and let me know what you think. One thing I need to tell you about uh, how bad do you want it that I really loved was I think it was in chapter one um, you were describing um, the war between uh, Sammy Wanderu versus Kabetti. I yeah. think it was in the 2010 Chicago Marathon. That's right. Right at sort of towards the end of the chapter, um, when you were describing the back and forth war between these two guys, like one guy would attack and like Wanjiru would attack and then Kibeti would hold him and then just that back and forth struggle and the suffering that those two guys went through, you really painted a, a really good picture. It was – Particularly with it, because I was listening to it uh, through audio, I thought you did a really good job on that. Thank you. Yeah, it was actually really good. Um, I jumped on YouTube, you know, later on that day and brought up, um, you know, that clip between those two guys. I think it was the last five minutes of the marathon, and you could actually see. Yeah, it was. It was an epic battle. It was. It was quite incredible. You know, one guy would surge, the other guy would hold him. And then um, Juan Giroux would, you know, move from the right side to the left side and attack on, down the left and back and forth. And it was, I, I hadn't actually, um, I wasn't aware of that particular um, rivalry in that uh, in that event before. You know, I'm, I'm aware of other rivalries in other sports and stuff, but uh, that particular one uh, missed me. But um, yeah, it was it was a really good um, description that you that you made. Thank you. How did that book uh, come about? How bad did you want it? When did um, when did the seeds start to sprout in your mind? Um, early days, like how did that sort of come about? Well, you know, as I describe it in the book, I've had a, a, a strong interest in the psychology of endurance sports ever since I ran my first endurance race, which was a race of approximately a mile dis dis distance running uh, when I was, I believe, in the fifth grade. Um, it just, you know, I, I ran that race, I won it, um, but I just suffered in a way that was just wholly new to my experience as a human being. Uh, you know, I was like, what is this? But I walked away from it thinking, you know, that's what this sport is about, that, um, you know, it helps to be fast and to be skinny and have good lungs, you know, if you want to be a runner. But it was just really when it came down down to it, all about the capacity to suffer. Um, and and so that's I've I've felt that way ever since. And you know, fast forward a, a couple decades to when I started writing about uh, endurance sports, um, that coincided with kind of the brain revolution, you know, where 
you know, for the first time that that black box was opened and scientists started to really learn, you know, you know what's going on, the chemistry and uh, of our brains and, and even as it relates to endurance sports. And of course, that led to a much greater appreciation for the role of the brain and mind in relation to endurance sports. So I thought, well, that, that's a great opportunity for me to to uh, kind of immerse myself in that subject matter because it was so interesting to me and to become kind of a conduit between the scientists and and athletes themselves and also between uh, elite athletes and and other athletes because I think elite athletes, you know, you can't succeed at the highest level of any endurance sport, you know, in this day and time unless you've got pretty much an A-plus mental game. Um, so, I, you know, that's a role I, I just sort of uh, – you know, took on for myself. So I've, I've written other books on this topic. Uh, one was called uh, Brain Training for Runners, another one called Run and subtitled The Mind-Body Method of Running by Feel, and then this one, How Bad Do You Want It? Um, but I just chose to, uh, because there's, there's a lot going on, so the science keeps evolving. So I felt, you know, I, I hadn't said all I, all I wanted to say on the topic, but also I wanted to take kind of a narrative approach, you know, as you know, having listened to the book, um, it's really a collection of stories, and the science is woven into those stories. Uh, because I, you know, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of endurance sports. In addition to being an endurance athlete, and there, some of these stories are just incredibly inspiring and also um, edifying. You know, they teach us things. So that's the the approach I wanted to take for this particular book. Yeah, the common um, theme throughout the book, uh, you talk about the perception of effort. Yes. Um, are you able to go into that and um, tell us what that is? Yeah. So, you know, perception of effort is a distinct perception. Um, so, you know, we all know what perceptions are. They're things like, uh, you know, thirst, hunger, uh, temperature sensation, all these ways in which our bodies are able to uh, interact with and sense the world around us. And they're all distinct. I mean, you can never really uh, confuse pain for thirst, right? Um, so perception of effort is, you know, just it, its own its own perception, which is highly relevant to endurance sports performance. And, and what you're feeling, you know, w- when you uh, when you are perceiving effort is um, it's the intensity of your brain's will to make your body move, you know, to make your body move, especially when you are fatigued or when you are trying to go as fast as you can, um, you have, your brain has to will your body to move and you can feel that, you know, at at any given point in any given race, someone can ask you, how hard are you working? Uh, how hard is it? And you can answer that question. And so that's what you're feeling is perception of effort. And what this, uh, this new, uh, so-called psychobiological model of endurance performance is showing, and that's really what I explore in in this book, uh, it's showing that perception of effort is kind of the be-all, end-all of endurance performance, that um, that's what really limits us. So if you you run a race and finish in a certain amount of time and you ask yourself, why did I finish in that amount of time and not 10 seconds or a minute faster? The reason is because you hit at some point close to the finish line of that race your maximum tolerance for perceived effort. It's not because you hit any kind of hard physiological limit. Those limits exist, you know, the physical limits, but we're actually never able to directly encounter them except in very short all-out efforts because we hit that psychological limit, the limit of our tolerance for perceived effort first. Yeah, the, um, you, you also talk about the, uh, there's the 30 seconds of maximum effort. Yes, yeah, what well, what is that? Yeah, so you know it's um it's just psychology. I mean, you can ask yourself, you know, why is running hard? You know, why why do I even feel bad when I run? Um, you know, there's a reason for that. It's because you know basically nature doesn't want us to waste effort unnecessarily. So you know, <laughs> the harder you run, the the more it hurts, and the longer you run at any intensity, the more fatigued you become when running. Uh, the more un- uncomfortable it is. But uh, so all you're doing really is out when you're out there, you know, competing or pushing your body, you're just making a calculation like, is this worth it? You know, the, the, the harder you push, the longer you go, the more you're suffering. And you keep asking yourself, you know, is this worth it? 
and, and you know, when you slow down, you've just made the decision, this isn't worth it. But in, in a very short effort, you know, when you're just sprinting, you know, for 100 meters, yes, like because because you are willing your body to move as as fast or as hard as it possibly can, you experience maximal perceived effort, you know, a very, very high level of effort right from the get go, right out of the blocks. If you're a sprinter, you know, you're experiencing about as much perceived effort as you can tolerate. But, you know, consciously it's going to be over with in 11 or 12 seconds. So. You know, you can endure anything for 11 or 12 seconds, but once you get beyond what the research is showing is that, you know, you're always aware of your effort, but perceived effort becomes limiting in efforts that last longer than about 30 seconds. If it's less than 30 seconds, your attitude is it's going to be over with soon enough. I can just, you know, I can just gut it out. But if the race is longer than about 30 seconds, then you start to pace yourself and manage your effort. Because you know if you went all out or even too hard for a minute, two minutes, an hour, two hours, then you would reach a point where you could just not tolerate the level of effort you were experiencing. Do you think people are born with – in your book, you, you go into quite a bit of detail around um, you know, the perception of effort and various psychological factors around, um, around this. Do you think people are born – um, with that, with uh, in, innate ability to to overcome and continue pushing forward, or do you think that's um, learnt? I, I think it's very much both. Um, and this really, it's you know, my opinion is who am I? I'm just a writer. But that's what you know. That's what psychology you know indicates um, is that you know just as personality, because that's all it really is. You know, it's just an, an element of it's your personality that determines whether you're good at suffering or not. And and your personality is is something you're uh, to some degree born with, but it's also shaped by your, your life experiences. Um, so in the book, I, I talk about examples of athletes who were clearly born with, uh, you know, a, a, a mental disposition that was well suited to in, you know, endurance racing. But I also talk about examples of people who had to uh, cultivate it the hard way, who didn't necessarily have a high degree of mental toughness, um, and you know, just through you know, you know, dreaming big and uh, persisting as athletes, you know, they were able to bootstrap their way to having you know even an elite level of of uh, you know, mental fitness. Yeah, um, yeah, that's what I love with. Uh endurance running like long distance running um you know when you're 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 really suffering and you're in a world of pain and you're continually asking yourself like it's like you're just thinking why am i doing this why why that it's just the pain's too full on i'd rather be at home sitting down chilling out and but at uh at the same time there's you know, there's those doubts that sort of creep into your mind. Oh, I'm going to pull the plug. It's it's time to quit. But for me, it's um, it's not. It's it's. Uh, I'm just going to keep pushing that desire to quit or pull the plug. I'm just going to put that aside for now and just keep enduring the pain. And you know, we'll we'll see how we go. I know that you know I'm really suffering, and uh, there is going to be light at the end of the tunnel eventually. Just bear with it. And eventually you do come out of that, um, you know, that rut. Yeah, I, I, I feel you. I mean, that's, it's hard, it's hard to communicate that to people who don't do what we do, uh, because it looks like masochism, doesn't it? You know, it's like you're suffering and you like it. It's like, no, I don't really like suffering. I, I like the challenge of suffering and I like what I get out of the experience, um, if I don't quit, but no, I don't like suffering. And <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, it's for me in many ways, it's, um, overcoming that desire to quit. Yes. Um, you know, you push yourself to the the limit and, you know, there's all these other factors where, you know, you, the chafing's full on, um, you know, you're dehydrated, um, you know, you might be injured, uh, you know, from training, um, and there's all there's all these factors that you're you're juggling in your mind, 
um, and all these factors are, are, are pulling at you to, to try and quit. And it's, for me, it's about um, overcoming that and enduring, enduring that suffering. And ultimately, it's about growth for me, that spiritual growth. Uh, that, that's what I, uh, I love about um, yeah, running and uh, those endurance sports. Yeah. Those, I mean, the rewards of not quitting are, are very real and lasting. Um, so you, you get something out of it. Um, if you do quit, you hate yourself, <laughs> but, but if you don't, you know, you're proud of yourself and, and you, you've earned a kind of self-regard that you, you can't just buy, you know, and you can't get it in any other way unless you just put yourself in the fire and don't blink. Uh, one of the topics that you talk about in the book, um, it's internally focused versus externally focusing. Um, I know where, particularly when you're suffering, um, if you're internally focusing on, you know, trying to overcome whatever you go, you're going through yourself, sometimes I've found that that can be a little bit harder than if you externally focus. You know, if you focus your attention outwardly to your kids or um, your friends or your family or your workmates to try and draw inspiration from those externally facing factors, often I find that that um, can help me pull through more than if I'm internally focusing. Yes. Yeah. You know, that that's a really interesting area of, of research in, in sports science. Um, and it, it applies to every sport. You know, one of the reasons I wrote How Bad You Want It is because I feel that endurance sports are different from other sports. And up to this date, sports psychology had been just kind of one size fits all. Um, and I thought, you know what? You know, there's no ball in a triathlon. <laughs> you know, there's no team. You know, it's just you against your suffering. And, and you need a psychology that's specific to that. But in this one area that, that you brought up, you know, uh, internal versus external attentional focus, it seems like, you know, what works best really is one size fits all. So, for example, there are studies showing that um, if you shoot basketball free throws and you focus your attention on uh, aiming toward the back of the rim versus focusing on snapping your wrist, when you let go. So focusing on aiming for the back of the rim would be external. Focusing on that feeling of snapping your wrist as you let go of the ball would be internal. So in that particular study I'm referencing, the same subjects were much more accurate shooting the basketball when they were focusing externally, sort of on the interface between their body and their environment uh, versus internally on, you know, feeling, feeling good technique, snapping your wrist. You should snap your wrist when you release the ball. But when you focus on that, uh, you don't shoot as well. And it's the same with endurance sports, that it, it, if you focus sort of on the, on the most relevant aspects of the task at hand, so you know, those would be putting a target on the back of the runner in, ahead of you, or uh, concentrating on maintaining your pace, you know, if you have a particular goal pace, those things, they, they focus your attention externally. They sort of immerse you in what you're doing. Uh, Versus an internal focus, you start to think, wow, I'm really suffering or wow, I really doubt, you know, that I'm as good a runner as I thought I was. Uh, you know, when, when the focus shifts inward like that, perception of effort actually increases. In fact, there have even been studies showing that if you run while thinking about your breath, you become less economical than if you run focusing on the external environment. Uh, it, as crazy as it sounds, it, it, it's true. So yeah, you want to, it's, uh, you know, th th this is that whole flow concept uh, of just almost like, uh, becoming unself-conscious and just becoming what you're doing. You know, if you talk to any experienced athlete, endurance athlete, and, they'll, and you ask them about their, their greatest race, and they'll tell you they, they, they their greatest race is when they have that flow experience and they just, that internal critic just disappears and they become fully immersed in what they're doing. And, you know, effort, extreme effort becomes sort of effortless in a way when that happens. Yeah, no, flow, flow, the, the, that particular topic has, um, 
um, been quite, uh, it, it's come out more in the last few years, you know, the flow state. Yes. Um, you know, when you, that, that seems to be the state that, uh, uh, a lot of athletes or even artists, um, uh, aspire to immerse themselves in, you know, when, um, time seems to disappear and you're completely at one with what you're doing, whether it's, uh, through running or swimming or, um, artists, um, yeah, it's a, it, it's, it's almost like a drug, I think that, um, yeah, drugs are involved. They just happen to be endogenous ones that are created by your own body. Um, just there was another um, note that I, I took listening to your book around self uh, self belief comes from letting go. Um, a lot of Eastern philosophies and Eastern religions, like um, Buddhism and Zen, they it's all about the mind and letting go of the mind. Um, do you think? Yeah, there it's le- letting go, um, and also going back to that uh, topic we were talking about before around um, you know focusing externally. By focusing externally, you set yourself up to allow yourself to let go of your mind. Yeah, there's this uh, someone who read who read my book uh, uh, sent me a, a tweet on on Twitter uh, with a quote from uh, Bruce Springsteen. And the quote was, uh, I can't, I can't actually give you, give you the quote, but he was saying that, uh, you know, when he goes on stage, he's sort of a, of two minds uh, in a, and one half of his mind, he's thinking in order to perform my best, in order to give these people who've paid, you know, good money to see me perform the show they deserve, I need to treat this like it's the most important thing in the world. Um, on the other hand, he feels like if he, if that's the only thing that's going on in his mind, th- there's uh, he puts a lot of pressure on himself, and, and he he might you know sort of lock up. Um, so there's another half of his mind that thinks, you know what, it's just rock and roll, <laughs> you know, it, it ain't no big deal. It should be fun. Um, and, and athletes, especially in team sports, they'll talk about how they perform best as a team when they're loose. Um, you know, if they go into a competition, you know, of course they want to win. You have to want to win if you're going to have any chance of winning. But if there's just a sort of a sort of letting go, just, you know what? I still think I'm great whether I win or lose. And it's just a game. It's sort of that balance between things that seem mind states that seem almost antithetical that really produces the best performance. And it's true in endurance sports as well. You know, you have to dream big. You have to set ambitious goals. But if those goals become, you know, the be all end all to the point where if you fail, uh, you just won't forgive yourself or you think, you know, I'm a terrible athlete. Champions don't really have that mindset. When champions lose, they make excuses. You know, it wasn't me. It was that, you know, I drank something that screwed me up or, or it was too hot. You know, you want to go into a race feeling like I really want to do my best. But at the same time, you know what? Um I love myself regardless, or I think I'm a, a good athlete regardless. So you have that kind of looseness that allows you to just, you know, relax a bit and pursue your goal um, in in that kind of state. There's a there's a a quote um, I know in the ultra world, and it, it it might it might it's sort of it's relevant for all endurance sports, but um, they say that uh, oh, I'll have to come back to it. It, it was it was something along the lines of. Um, uh, I'll, I'll have to come back to it. I've I've lost. All right, it. but I I've got to know now. I've got to know. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll uh, <laughs> it'll come back to me. Um, but well, yeah, we'll just move. <laughs> it's one of those things. <laughs> yeah. So with um, physical fitness versus mental fitness, um, going into like a, a marathon, for example, um, obviously you need to be physically fit. Um, would you say there's more of a weighting towards? the mental fitness as a, uh, over the physical fitness aspect for an athlete going into a, an endurance uh, event like a, a marathon or a, an Ironman? Yeah. So, you know, when you wake up on race morning, you're either fit or you're not, you know, there's nothing you can do at that point. 
to affect that that component of uh, performance. Uh, but you know, during a race itself, you know, especially you know, in the hours that precede a race and throughout it, um, you know, y- your race will be made or broken based on uh, what you think and what your emotions are. Uh, so you want to sort of, you know, self-regulate your thoughts and emotions in the most helpful way possible. It also helps throughout the entire training process. You know, when you're, when you're physically preparing for race, you should also be mentally preparing for race. I mean, you're always doing both whether you want to or not, but it's just really helpful to be conscious that, you know, you're not just working out. Uh, you are also training your brain uh, when you're getting ready for competition. But certainly when it comes to race day itself, you know, the, the physical side of it, it's, it's baked in. Um, and, but you know, what you do inside your head, uh, on race day is it's everything. Now you're a coach as well. Is that right? Yeah. I don't, I don't do much, uh, sort of one-on-one coaching. Uh, it's a lot of sort of coaching the masses through, uh, um, well, I, I create custom training plans, but I also create training plans that kind of live online that people can purchase. And I'm also a coach for something called uh, Team Iron Cowboy, which is kind of a, a subscription-based online community of athletes. Uh, it's, it's myself and two other coaches that lead that. And the Iron Cowboy, that's the Iron Cowboy, is it? What? Yeah, that's the Iron Cowboy, James Lawrence, 50 Ironmans in 50 states in 50 days. Have you met, uh, you've met him, obviously? Yes. Yeah, I didn't know him before he started that. So he did this last year, uh, last summer uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and uh, I I went out for his very last one, his 50th day in his home state of Utah, uh, because he was interested in, in uh, doing a book, but he's not a writer himself. Um, so I just wanted to see what he was all about, you know, judge sort of his level of authenticity and and just see if I really, if I wanted to help him tell his story. And, uh, you know, by the time that day was over, I would have cut my own right arm off to write the story. <laughs> in your years of writing and, uh, I know in California, um, you know, sports is, is massive. Um, are there any particular athletes that you've met over the years that really stand out for you in terms of their mental toughness? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I, I hesitate to, to bring him up, but what, what can I say? This is an honest answer to the question. Lance Armstrong is one of them. Um, I met Lance on the day he announced that he had beaten cancer and and would return to cycling, cycling. Um, and I caught him at a really good time because he had no job you know, most of his sponsors had abandoned him and, and literally given him up for dead. Um, so he showed up at this uh, big cycling industry trade show called Interbike, really hat in hand, looking for a job. Um, and and so I was able to sit down with him alone for an interview for an extended period of time. Um, and I came away just uh, knowing that his best days as an athlete were ahead of him because of how he impressed me with his mind. Uh, Um, it's just, you know, you know, yes, he, he did use performance enhancing drugs. He's admitted it. Um, but you can't, you know, I couldn't win the tour de France seven times just by using performance enhancing drugs. You have to have something else going, going on. And for him, you know, for him, it was, you know, and I mentioned him and how bad do you want it? Because what's interesting is that there's no single formula for success, um, in mental fitness, what's really cool is that different personality traits, just things that are within you that make you, you know, unique as a person can, can, uh, manifest as strengths on the, on the race course. And in Lance's case, it it was a kind of arrogance. Um, it just kind of a a me against the world mentality. Just, I've never encountered anyone with with just a more unshakable self-belief. Um, so he's one, you know, do I, do I like him or is he a good person? Those are different questions. Um, but you know, he, he definitely had mental attributes. There are other examples I could give, but you know, I think, you know, in terms of personal experiences that, that one, uh, you know, affected me. Yeah, you could, um, you know, there's always the argument of performance enhancing drugs, uh, you know, with Lance Armstrong and, 
um, you know, the the debate around whether, you know, the whole the whole tour is pretty much arguably uh, on drugs. So in that respect, you know, you could maybe argue that it is a level playing field if they're all on the same stuff. But even if you had a clean tour um, where you had all the same athletes, all the same riders who were 100% clean, the the mindset of, you know, the, the at the very pointy end of uh, the field, you'd probably still see the same results. Yep. You know, like um, whether they're on drugs or if in another universe the, the whole – Tour de France weren't on drugs, the the outcomes would you could argue would most probably be the same somewhat. Yeah, I think that's that's probably the case. I mean, you know, I think an expert might say there are, you know, quote, responders and non-responders. So some people that probably benefit from drugs a little more than others do. But yeah, you know, Lance Armstrong won a world championship at age 23 when he was not on drugs. Um, so, you know, he, he was a generational talent, um, you know, with or without them. Yeah. Also in your book, um, you, you do in some of the chapters talk about, um, uh, the tour, the tour de France, um, and some of the, uh, I love the, the story of, uh, Cadell Evans and, uh, Andy Schleck. That was really good as well. Being an Aussie. Yeah. Um, and, uh, Cadell Evans, that was really good. Uh, and also in chapter three, you were talking about um, Greg Lamont versus uh, Fignon. Yep. That was another um, story that I think, because that was in 1989, it was a little bit before my time, um, the final time trial. And I actually jumped on uh, YouTube and, and checked it checked it out as, as well. But um, that was, that came right down to the, the wire. Um, you know, that final time trial, Greg Lamont versus the hometown guy you know the french guy um eight eight seconds after three weeks of racing that you can't you can't get any closer than that or yes you can you can get six seconds closer than that (laughs) yeah so do you think um these people that you talk about or or the um the attribute of how bad do you want it do you think people are willing to die in some situations you know, like uh, whether they're battling against uh, someone else in a particular race. Do you think some people are willing to die in a particular race or in a fight or in whatever sport they're in? I think I think so. Um, you know, th- if you ask them, uh, they probably wouldn't answer it that way. But in, in actions speak louder than words sometimes. Um and it's funny because actually getting back to Lance uh, in that interview I did with him, I asked that very question. You know, I asked him, you know, after almost dying, you know, as a result of this disease, are you going to be willing to take the same kinds of risks that you took, uh, you know, before you got sick? And that was actually, you know, this is going way back to before. This is before Lance ever won a single tour. But I, I had been following him just because I'm you know, an insider to endurance sports from the very beginning before most people had ever heard of the guy. Um, and I knew that there were whispers about even then that maybe, Oh, maybe he got cancer because of performance enhancing drugs. So I wasn't going to answer, I wasn't going to ask the question explicitly, like, will you take drugs? But that's sort of what I meant. Sort of, I was hinting at if, if he would take risks, but I remember him saying that, um, you know, if, he answered it in a slightly different way, saying that, you know, if if he was, you know, gapped by the leader in a stage and he wanted to catch up with him and he had to fly down, you know, uh, steep switchbacks, you know, in the Alps in order to catch up and just risk going right off the road and falling to his death to catch back up, he would absolutely do that without hesitation. So, you know, there, you know, So, you know, that was his answer to the question. So I believe it, you know, maybe you meant it more in terms of like sort of, you know, death through just sheer effort. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Like a heart attack. (laughs) Yeah. But I think the answer is yes. If you just look at, again, actions versus words, um, you know, a lot of these guys probably would. I wouldn't myself. (laughs) 
Um, in your coaching, um, is there a common set of questions uh, that people ask you, um, like psychological? No, I'm not talking about the physical training, uh, more around the psychology. Is there any sort of common questions that people that you coach um, continually raise and ask ask you? Well, what I notice with the athletes I coach is that there's, um, in terms of like, you know, psychological barriers to Im- improvement and development, the the biggest one actually is just um, fear of the unfamiliar or um, sort of being wedded to habit. You know, er- every athlete I coach, you know, they're already doing things a certain way. Um, and of course, they come to me because it's not working. <laughs> You know, if they were just getting better and better, they would keep coaching themselves. Uh, but they come to me because they, they want to get better. But time and time again, I, I there's like a resistance to changing things up and, and trying things that are that are that are different. Um, and I see that uh, you know you know quite a bit. Uh, it's just um, it, uh, it it's a big one. It looms pretty large in the psychology of endurance sports. It's just um, you know wanting to keep doing what you're already doing just because, you know, all habits are hard to break, uh, including, you know, just your routine, whatever it is, your routine as an endurance athlete, you know, the, the, one of the things I, I, I try to make all my athletes do is slow down, uh, you know, especially, you know, they're, and they're, they're the typical endurance athletes, easy, easy workouts are not in fact easy. Um, and, and, you know, I get so much resistance, uh, to that type of thing. So, that, that's a big one. I also wanted to touch on nutrition. Um, you're a certified nutritionist as well. Um, do you think nutrition also plays a big part in aiding um, this mental mindset? You know, by day in, day out, um, adopting a particular um, group of foods or a particular approach to nutrition – do you think that also aids the mental side of performance? That's a really interesting question. I, you know, the answer is that I would almost flip it around, um, and that sort of, I would say that a healthy psychology is the key to eating in a way that allows you to get the most out of nutrition. Um, it's a funny thing because you know, sort of, you know, healthy performance enhancing eating is so simple and basic. But, you know, as you probably know, you know, so many athletes just screw it up and either they're, you know, eating wrong and they know it, but they, and they want to eat better, but they just can't get out of their own way. Or they're, uh, you know, the sort of serial fad dieters where they try this and it doesn't work and they try that and it doesn't work. And it's all psychology. You know, what I find, um, I'm actually working on a book now where I've been traveling all over the world studying the eating habits of the world's most successful endurance athletes in all disciplines from rowing to cross-country skiing and everything in in between and what i find with uh, it's sort of similar you know i made the point earlier that you can't succeed at the highest level of of endurance sports without an a plus mental game well it's the same thing with diet so you know i what i want to know is like what is an a plus diet (laughs) Um, and, and what I found, you know, it's, I found a, a number of things, but one of the patterns is all of these athletes are really just happy with the way they eat. You know what I mean? They don't, it's no big deal. It's just, it's just how they eat. You know, they have really, really good, healthy diets, but they also enjoy them. You know, they're, they're not, you know, they're not freaking out about necessarily counting calories or macronutrients or, you know, like just you know, giving up everything that's familiar to them to like go all in for some, you know, super strict, you know, left of center eating regimen or whatever. It's just like all normal stuff, just very high standards. And they, they don't, they don't like spend a lot of time and energy or invest a lot of stress or worry into diet. It's just, they have a healthy breakfast, a healthy, healthy lunch, healthy dinner, and that's all there is to it. Yeah, there's a lot of um, fad diets out there. You know, there's, you know, the Atkins and Paleo and, um, you know, you got, um, you know, low carb, high fat, um, all these other, there's all these different labels that people sort of slap on um, these diets. But um, 
do you think by adopting, by just simplifying, not getting too caught up in, you know, in the media around uh, certain diets and nutrition and that, do you think just by simplifying and simplifying your approach to nutrition is the best way, as in um, cutting out highly processed foods, cutting out sugar, you know, like uh, refined sugar or, or drastically reducing refined sugar, minimizing alcohol, um, you know, junk food, um, soft drinks, that sort of stuff. Do you think that – what's your sort of take on um, on that? Yeah, so I, I just wrote an article recently for competitor.com that was about – basically the headline was uh, don't replace your diet, improve it. Um and and that's what you see. It's really interesting if you if you follow the 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 career tra- trajectory of any given uh, world class endurance athlete. What you'll find is that all of them just grow up eating whatever mom makes. You know what I mean? They're they're just like the rest of us. But because by virtue of you know their their talent, as soon as they take up whatever their, their sport is, whether it's running or triathlon or whatever, they win. And, you know, they win in high school and they win at, at university and then they, they, they may become pros and stop winning. You know, so for the first time in their lives, they're not winning. And then, of course, they, they think, all right, I need to whatever I'm doing wrong, I need to start doing better because I can't just get by on my talent alone at that point. So at that point, often, you know, at age 22 or whatever, you know, athletes of, of the high, very highest level of genetic talent will look to, you know, train smarter or recover better or improve their diet. And if, if there is room for improvement in their diet, and, and I've studied this, you know, what they all do at that point is they don't go on the Atkins diet. They don't go on the paleo diet or low carb, high, what is it? Low carb, high fat. They simply copy what their training partners do. The ones who are beating them in workouts and races and it's always just it's it's a it's a minimalist approach. They don't start over. They don't just throw out everything they've, they've been doing. They fix the very minimum number of things they have to fix. So if they haven't been eating enough, they eat more. If they haven't been eating enough vegetables, they eat more. So it's just it's an evolution, not this wholesale replacement of, of their diet, which so many recreational athletes fall for because um, they have too much at stake. They're not just gonna, they're not going to get too clever by half. Um, you know, when, when they could lose a sponsorship or, you know, you know, just have to get a real, a real job. So that's, that's what you see. And if that works for them, you better believe it works for the rest of us. Just, so just whatever you're doing already, that can be the foundation for whatever is going to be your optimal diet. You know, you just need to raise the bar somewhat, fix the things that need fixing, but don't start over, you know, don't leap 180 degrees to whatever, you know, fad diet your training partner might be on that's unnecessary and ultimately uh, it just won't work. Just want to ask you about um, your process around actually writing, whether it's for a book or uh, writing a new book or uh, an article for a magazine or something like that. Do you use any particular software uh, that helps you write? Uh, And also, do you literally sit at the keyboard and type away or do you also use like a, maybe like a voice recorder to take notes how do you what's your process around uh the actual pro, um uh around uh, writing itself yeah so for me you know i'm i'm uh i have i guess kind of an old school fairly low tech approach to writing you know the microsoft word is is my friend um it's the only program i use you know for word processing and composition um, I actually cannot type in terms of like, you know, I, I hunt and peck with two fingers. Um, I never took a typing class. Um, but that's fine for me because when you're composing, it's not how fast you type that limits, you know, your, your speed. It's how fast you can think. <laughs> um, you know, and so I, I, you know, if you want to form a sentence that actually reads well, that takes longer than than typing, so I, I'm not I'm not slowed down by that inability, and I don't use a lot of recording for the same reason that it, it would take forever to transcribe. So I, I would have to hire someone, you know, to do transcriptions for me. Um, and one thing that I think is a little bit unique about me as a writer is that I really a lot of writers will do this whole research process before they ever start writing, but I like to sort of mix them together. 
which often means I, I need to end up, I end up needing to rewrite a lot of stuff because I'll start writing before I even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but for me, I don't feel like I'm, I've found that you haven't really thought anything through until you've tried to put it down on, on paper or, you know, virtual paper. So it helps me a lot, even though I know I'm going to have to, you know, undo a lot of what I do. It, I, I find that writing at the same time I'm researching just kind of helps me, um, you know, think, think things through to the point where I know I do know what I'm talking about. Do you ever get writer's block? And if you do, do you ever like just go for a run to clear your mind? And does that ever help with uh, overcoming writer's block at all? Yeah, I mentioned at the beginning of the interview that I'm a chip off the old block, uh, just very much like my father. And, and he he never gets writer's block. He's 70. He's going to turn 73 this year. Um, and he's never had a day of writer's block in his life. And he's he's doing his best work ever. He's just an idea factory. And I, I'm very much the same way. I've always just, I'm just spilling over with ideas. I do have bad days of writing, you know, just sort of like, you know, when you go out for a run and for no particular reason, you just feel terrible. <laughs> and it's like, I slept well. I didn't do a hard workout yesterday. I've been in a good groove. Why do I feel this bad? It, the same thing can happen with writing where it's not that I'm uninspired or that I'm blocked. It's just everything I write is garbage. So I have those days. And often I really, you know, because often, uh, you know, a big part of the writing process is actually problem solving. So you'll get to a point in, in something you're writing where you sort you have to make a decision and decide, you know, do I go this way or that way? Or, you know, just there's just some problem that is blocking further progress. Um, and at, at that point, you're exactly right. If I go out and get on my bike and go for a ride, I, I'm still writing. I'm just writing in my head away from the computer. And I don't need, I don't even necessarily to, need to force it. I just sort of let it happen. Um, and something about that, um, uh, that alpha wave state your brain goes into when you're just doing repetitive motion is so conducive to that kind of creativity. So almost inevitably, by the time I get back from one of those workouts, I've got a solution to whatever that roadblock was. We were talking about flow state before. Were you? Do you ever get into that flow state um, when you're writing? You know, like you're 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 typing away, and next thing you know, two hours has gone past. Have you ever? Yes, oh, it, it happens very often. I mean, th those are the good days. You know, when you know you just you. It, it's exactly that. You, you you're just your whole world is that screen and, and the words on it. Um, and you're, yeah, you can just look up and, and realize that you forgot to eat dinner and the sun has gone down. Um, it, it's a beautiful thing. I live for it. And how long does it take from idea through to day one of it, the book is published? It, can you give us maybe a, an idea of the time frame? you know, from when you sort of commit, yeah, I'm going to start, I'm going to, I want to publish a book on this particular topic through to it's now published. What sort of time, how long does that take? Sometimes, uh, interestingly enough, the gestation period is the longest part. Uh, and how bad do you want it? My latest book is, is a good example for that. When, you know, cr creativity is just a mysterious thing. That's why, you know, you have this concept of the muse, like it, it's like some, you know, divine source outside of yourself that just kind of feeds you stuff <laughs> in your brain. Cause you don't feel like you're in control of it. You know, it's like, you know, pregnancy for a woman, it's like you're growing a baby inside you, but are you actually actively doing it? No, it's just, it's just happening. Uh, so, you know, for how bad you want it as just as an example, I just, I knew there was something there. I knew that I, I wanted to explore this concept of perception of effort um, but I also knew I, you know, I had been collecting these stories over time, just like, you know, because I, like I said before, I'm a fan of these sports. I'm an admirer of, of the greatest athletes. And I have this profound urge to, to make other athletes appreciate them the way I do. So, you know, when I see a race like the one you described between, uh, Wanjiru and Kebida, um, it, you know, it gives me goosebumps. Sometimes I, you know, I'll almost come to tears watching something like that. I want, I, and I would think I want to, I want other people to feel that too. Um, so I sort of had these two things that I wanted to do and I felt like they could come together, but I, I just didn't know how it was going to work. So I didn't force it. I just worked on other stuff and just some part of my brain just kind of worked on that. And then finally I got to this point 
it was actually when I came up, up with the metaphor of the firewalk that I come to, I come back to it's sort of a refrain from out throughout the book and I won't belabor it, but it's just, a, it's just like a metaphor for endurance racing, this firewalking metaphor. When that came to me, I knew I was ready to write the book and then things happened, you know, pretty quickly. I, 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 as you might imagine, you know, I couldn't have written as many books as, as I have, uh, unless I, I I'm able to, to work pretty quickly. So that might, that was maybe just nine months, you know, in terms of just, just writing the darn thing. And then, then you go through the editing process and wait for the publisher to get the marketing together and release it. Yeah. It's funny when you said, um, you know, you get so emotional, um, you know, tears start to well up in your eyes and stuff like that. I, I get exactly the same way. Um, particularly when I see in the sporting context, those really, those real moments of courage in sport, you know, when you see someone overcoming the odds and come and pulling through, you know, it doesn't matter whether they, they, they come first or last or in the middle or whatever, but you see certain, um, real heroic aspects of, um, what humans are capable of. And sometimes I'm on YouTube and, you know, you just, you go down the rabbit hole and um, you, you start to search for, you know, those sort of heroic um, uh, acts in sport, uh, you know, and you, you, I'm there and my wife's making fun of me and, you know, all tears are in my eyes and stuff like that. There's one particular race, um, uh, Haley Gabra Selassie, Versus another guy, it was in the 2000 Olympics. I think it was the 10,000 meter final. Yeah, the the uh, the the battle, the final 200 meters. Um, Gabra Selassie, he was the defending champion. Um, the smaller guy, and that this is also another um, how bad do you want it moment where you know just this epic struggle for ten. Oh, you know, it's the Olympic final and these two guys have been rivals for, for a decade beforehand. Um, and seeing those two battle it out, you know, over the 10 Ks and then the final 200 meters, um, seeing Gabra Selassie almost summon this, this something from within himself, um, to overcome and, and triumph. That was, uh, that was, a, another really good moment, um, that sort of springs to mind for me. Yeah. The, uh, you, uh, Anyone who doesn't know what you're talking about should talking about should just Google uh, a search phrase with those names and 2000 Olympics. If, if you just see the photos, yeah. the still photos alone are are uh, those are goosebump raising. Yeah, yeah. And I actually read another article you had on your website. Um, your website is actually mattfitzgerald.org. You had an article. Um, uh, around how old is Haley Gabra Selassie? Do you reckon he's uh, older than what um, is reported? I think so. Um, how much older, you know, who's to say? Um, you know, but I tried to find, you know, people who would know uh, one way or the other. And, you know, there was, uh, you know, the, there was a general consensus that, you know, he, he's at least a, a year or two older than, than he says. And and he himself is very cagey about age, always has been, and and that itself, you know, <laughs> is uh, signals that that he 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 perhaps the, the thing is it's a little embarrassing because you know he 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 in fact does not know how old he is, so you understand that it's you know it's a you know like many Ethiopians of his generation he wasn't born in a hospital and it just they didn't record birthdays birth dates it just it wasn't done. Um, so uh, on the one hand, he doesn't know, but on the other hand, it was very, it has been very common for, you know, in East Africa, you know, for athletes to deliberately, um, fiddle with, with their ages in order to, you know, earn opportunities to, to compete abroad and, and, and have careers. So there's that going on as well. And, uh, whereabouts can people find you online and follow your progress and, any new books that uh, you're working on? Whereabouts can people find you and reach out to you? Yeah, you, you mentioned my, my website, mattfitzgerald.org, and that really is uh, the, the best starting point. You can you can uh, go anywhere from, from that hub. And just quickly, are you working on – have you got another – you mentioned you are working on another book? Yeah, it, 
Yeah, it's called the endurance diet. That is the one that I sort of, you know, uh, became a globe trotter, uh, just spending time uh, eating with Kenyan runners in Kenya and uh, uh, Dutch cyclists in Spain and and trying to identify, um, you know, real real world best practices with diet uh, for endurance athletes and kind of come up with kind of a kind of formula that the rest of us can can use to uh, become our own best selves as athletes. Yeah, I'll be looking forward to that one coming out. Uh, before you go, I do remember that quote nice. that I stumbled upon last time. Um, it was 90% of an ultra is in your mind and the other 10% is in your head. <laughs> that uh, sounds like Yogi Berra. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thanks for your time today um, coming on to the Born to Kick Ass podcast. It's been great talking with you. Uh, and uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, your, your new book coming out, Endurance Diet. All right. Thank you. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Yeah. Uh, another good, uh, another funny bit in your book that sort of made me chuckle. I was listening to it um, on the way to work. Um, the rower, one of the rowers, who had short arms. Yeah. And then you, one little sort of phrase you, that came out that sort of made me actually laugh was when he raised, like he he, he triumphed, he raised his um, T-Rex arms above his head. <laughs> that was so funny. Yeah. <laughs> I was just imagining, uh, yeah, someone with like real six-inch arms just sort of holding it above his head. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that was <laughs> Yeah, not, not a ton of humor in that book, but I guess there are a couple moments like that. <laughs> yeah, cool. All right. Well, thanks again for your time. And, All right. Um, thanks so much. Okay. Thanks, Matt. See ya. Cheers. You've just been listening to the Born to Kick-Ass podcast at borntokickass.com. If you liked what you heard and want more, please subscribe on iTunes. Give a five-star rating and a kick-ass review. This really helps to boost our presence and continues to allow us to introduce you to the most fascinating people on the planet. Welcome aboard and catch you next time.